I think this is an appropriate time uh, in, in our time together to offer a pastoral word uh, in this week. And that word for us is vote. As believers, uh, we are called not to be of this world, but to be in it. To be in it, it means that we live in relationships, we care for others, we enjoy the beauty of God's creation, care for the environment, make and appreciate beauty, participate in the production of goods and services, and make homes much, much more, including being responsible citizens. And that means when there is an election, we do as you do, we educate ourselves, we engage in civil discourse, and we vote. But we vote not first as citizens of the United States, but as we see in Paul's letter to the Philippians, and as Kaylee reminded us, we live as citizens of heaven. We are not of this world. In other words, our vote, our choices are not based on dominant culture values or even what your parents or your friends or you have always done. Nor are our choices made for personal gain. And they're not especially not made out of fear. Our political choices are to be made the same way as all our other choices are to be made in response to the living God revealed in Jesus Christ who was crucified and rose again for us, for all of humanity. We vote as disciples of the one to bring good news to the poor, to set the oppressed free, to partner with the spirit so that it may be on earth as it is in heaven. To be not of the world is to live realizing that salvation doesn't mean you're going to go to heaven full stop. But because you are going to heaven, you live with a freedom to love your neighbor, consider one another better than yourselves, and to seek justice, even if it costs us personally. We do not base our vote on one or two issues, because our vote supports or ignores many issues. We need to think widely. For sure, there are watershed issues, and these need to be weighed heavy and heavier than others, but not in a vacuum. Some issues can become like idols that conveniently obscure other issues of great importance as well. Or they can be issues that government is not well suited to deal with and cause us to diminish the ones that government can help with. Healthy churches do not have pastors who tell the congregation how to vote, especially not in terms of who and what. The how we do speak to, though, is the process. How do we vote? We consider Jesus. What is his character? What is his mission? Who does Jesus, Jesus champion? What idols does Jesus expose among the religious, especially? Jesus promises to be with you and me always. So what freedom does that give us? give you for others. I have one more word that I want to mention. Fear. As record gun sales, outbursts of violence, and attacks reveal, there's a good deal of fear rising in our polarized nation. And that is not likely to go away regardless of who is elected president. Now, I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist, or a sociologist, and I don't even play one on TV, right? But I am fairly confident that most fear is rooted in loss. We're afraid we will lose power, position, money, freedom, comfort, our life, or the life of loved ones. As followers of Christ, we are not immune to fear. But we... but we don't give in to it. We don't allow it to control us. We are equipped by the presence of the power of the Holy Spirit and the promises of God's word not to give in. Now, unless Jesus comes back real soon, there's going to be a November 4th. And 
addictions to outrage and the diminishing the value and rights of others will continue to occur. And they'll occur because of fear. Our families, our neighbors, our country need us to not be afraid, even if, especially if, this election brings unrest. You know the one who brings peace that surpasses all understanding. That means that we can listen to the fear around us and not play into it, but absorb it and dispose of it on the cross. We can be people of empathy, seeing how people who differ from us feel the way they do and to respond with compassion, understanding. We can be salt and light by our presence that trusts in a living God and loves our neighbor and speaks the word of truth and grace and hope. So our pastoral word to you this week, and really always, consider Christ, fear not, love your neighbor, and vote. And pray, as we'll take time to do now as we hear how great our Lord is. Thank you.
good to have people sharing their gifts with us. Thank you. Now we have another gifted person, um, Eldie Chapman, who spends time loving on our third uh, through fifth graders. And we are honored to have her with us always. But we are especially honored to have her read our scripture today. Eldie? Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you guys today. Um, I'm going to be reading Matthew 17, 22 to 18, 15 today. As they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the son of man is going to be betrayed into human hands and they will kill him. And on the third day, he will be raised and they were greatly distressed. Then they reached Capernaum. The collectors of the temple tax came to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the temple task tax? He asked, he said, yes, he does. And when he came home, Jesus spoke of it first, asking, what do you think, Simon? From whom do kings of the earth take toll or tribute? From their children or from others? When Peter said, from others, Jesus said to him, then the children are free. However, so that we do not give offense to them, go to the sea and cast a hook. Take the first fish that comes up, and when you open its mouth, you will find a coin. Take that and give it to them for you and me. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a child whom you put among them and said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, Ellie. Will you pray with me? Lord God, we bow our hearts and our minds before you. That through your word, by your spirit, we would be transformed more into the image of Christ, that we would know you more, reflect you more, and live in the hope and the joy that you have for us. Lord, we ask this in your son's name, and all God's people said, amen. A friend of mine says that you're only young once, but you can be immature forever. So while I'm not surprised by my immaturity, I am increasingly surprised by my age. And with that has come the passing into glory of many of the individuals that have nurtured my faith over the years and expanded my view of who God is. That's one of the beauties of Christian community. People who love you just for you, who share their reflections, their mistakes, and God's even greater grace and forgiveness. Who speak experientially of God's steadfast love and faithfulness. And I'm thankful for the Christian community that I've experienced. What maturity I have can be largely attributed to being in community like this and God working through community that demonstrates what it means to be people who love mercy, who do justice, and walk humbly with God. On this All Souls Day, when we remember the everyday saints who have gone before us and touched our lives, hopefully this is your story too. But increasingly, over these last several years, I encounter stories of people's experience with church and Christian organizations that are stories of hurt and confusion, full of events and statements that tear down faith and make people hesitant to consider Jesus and church. What does it take for followers of Christ to live in healthy community? In the portion of the Gospel of Matthew that Ellie just read, Jesus gives about a five-minute talk, if you put it all together, that lays out four ways that our life together can be more fully embodying God's character. And I'll do my best to reduce it to about 20. Jesus begins by speaking of the cross, his cross. He says, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into, the, into human hands, and they will kill him. And on the third day, he'll be raised. 
and they were greatly distressed. The disciples are distressed because that is not what they expected to hear. It doesn't make sense. This transfigured one, the miracle worker, the profound teacher, like no other who changes lives, who gives hope, he's going to die at the hands of the people he came to rescue? Their distress is a giveaway that either they did not hear his mention of the resurrection or they didn't understand it. But the cross and the resurrection is the shaping event for their lives and life together. It sends the message that living in relationship with Jesus is not business as usual. It's full of the unexpected, like loving those who do not love and will not treat you well, like giving life away and finding more life when you do. Greater still, the cross removes every barrier to being united with Christ, the God of the universe, and it declares his love and commitment to us. The resurrection declares Jesus is greater than anything we know. And it's that commitment, love, and greatness that frees us to following his uncommon ways. Our life is not to be shaped by our clenched fists demanding our way, but his nail-marked hands that lift us and guide us. With the cross, as the lens to see through, Jesus then provides the guidance on living together. In particular, he talks about living with people who don't get you, living with our desire to be significant and above the crowd, and then living with others who are younger in faith. Now, the first piece of wisdom for living in community occurs when the tax collectors, the temple tax collectors, ask Peter if Jesus pays the temple tax. Now, probably not wanting to get in trouble, Peter is just kind of immediately bursts out, oh, of course, yes. And you can imagine him looking over at Jesus with his eyes asking, right? When they get a chance to be alone, Jesus unpacks the event. Peter, do the kings of this world collect taxes from the royal family or from their subjects? Peter replied, well, from their subjects, of course. That's right. Jesus says, the children are free. Therefore, I, as the son of God, and you, as my brother, being children of the king, we are not subject to paying the tax. Just as Osh just pointed out about how the transfiguration with Moses and Elijah reveals that Jesus was greater than the temple, the law, and the prophets, Jesus is again asserting his greatness, that he is greater than the temple. And that as his followers, united in him, with him, we enjoy that freedom too. But Jesus chooses not to exercise that freedom in this situation. Instead, he says, but not to give offense, go pay the tax. And Jesus instructs Peter to go fishing and he will find in the mouth of a fish the money needed to pay the tax. Now, that's a fun little miracle that really is not the main point of this message or this passage at all. The place to focus our attention is on the word offense. We see Jesus give offense elsewhere, like when he turns over the tables uh, in the temple and he drives the money changers out. Why is he holding back here? It helps to see that the word offense in Greek, scandalon, was is what he uses, that where we get the word, what? Scandal and scandalize or scandalous. Jesus has every right to refuse to pay the tax and to use, to, that is used to, you know, buy sacrificial oxen and lambs and all that sort of thing. He, he, he's, because he is greater than the, the temple. But even more so, he has no, he has a right to refuse to pay that tax because he is the sacrifice, the once and forever sacrifice paid with his life. Yet Jesus doesn't want to scandalize people who do not get him and run the risk of turning them away over something like taxes. 
If they're going to be offended, let them be scandalized by the cross, the Messiah coming, not as a warrior king, but as the suffering servant, crucified and risen from the dead. That is where the attention needs to be. That is where the power to change lives is. Focus on that. He could show the tax collectors how wrong they are, how right he is, and have them harden their hearts to everything else and anything else about him. He'd win the battle, but lose the war. Then the story about Jesus would be about tax evader, not God in the flesh, crucified, risen Lord, greater than Caesar. Jesus knew where he wanted to use his shot, and it wasn't there. When it comes to people who don't get him, Jesus is flexible. He gives grace. He works so that the attention goes on who he is and not sidetracks by minor issues. In our desire to uphold Jesus' integrity, how often do we major on minor issues that drive people away from taking another step closer to Jesus? To see the one who sets the oppressed free, who does not just give life, but life abundant. The, the scripture then says, at the same time, that the disciples asked him, who would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? In so doing, they reveal that common desire for significance, to be somebody, to know where we stand compared to others. That can be an absolute killer for any community as people vie for attention, for power, for position. The disciples are ready most likely to hear about how pious, how serious, how many good deeds you have to do to be considered great. Instead, true to the unexpected way of the cross, Jesus calls a child who's nearby and places the child among them and says, Unless you change and become like children, like this child, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is not highlighting the perceived innocence of children, but their low status in the culture. They were to listen and obey. In that culture particularly, children were of very low account. Children can give themselves wholeheartedly to even the smallest task and not be ashamed. They're open to learning, not assuming that there's nothing anyone can teach them. And they're not too proud to receive gifts. In short, they have humility. This doesn't mean that we go around thinking we're worms or making ourselves less than we truly are. It means being mindful of how vastly greater Jesus is than who we are, and that he humbled himself to take on human form, to serve and give himself up that we may live. We can hear this echo in the Beatitudes that Jeff read with us. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meekness does not mean weak, but like the well-trained war horse that we talked about that is mighty in battle, well-trained, well-equipped, but submits to the will and direction of its rider. To be a child is not to fade from the picture. Notice that Jesus doesn't criticize the ambition to be great, but he redirects the process of how we're great to emphasize service over seeking greatness to care for those who are little in status, unconcerned for our own status. Communities that have childlike, not childish, but childlike people avoid much, much strife. People's gifts are brought forth. There's an openness to new things, and there's life there, new things that God is doing, and to learning. They also provide a countercultural taste of a castless community. Even though there's an array of people that the world would look at, the non cross perspective would say shouldn't be together, they don't match, nonetheless, they're together. Jesus is very clear about his language here, about 
that we are to be like a child. This isn't a throw a state way statement. He puts a lot of emphasis on this. What does that mean for us this week to be like a child? The third teaching that Jesus gives about living as a healthy community has some very harsh words in it. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believes in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone, not just those little grinder mortar things, I mean the kind that donkeys turn, these huge millstones, were fastened around your neck and you were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of stumbling blocks. Occasions for stumbling are bound to come, Jesus says, but woe to the one by whom the stumbling block comes. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or lame than to have two hands and two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out, throw it away. It's better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell. That is incredibly strong language from a loving person. But it's exactly because Jesus is loving that he says these things. Jesus values the community, but he also values the individual and gives special concern for the little ones. Not just children, but the vulnerable in faith, the ones young in faith. So Jesus says, watch it. Hard things are going to come in and hurt these people's faith, just like it does for all of us. But it better not come in to their lives through you. What are these stumbling blocks? Jesus doesn't articulate them, but our own history and our observation can probably list things in words that tear down people's faith. Betrayal of trust, emotional, physical, sexual abuse, teaching false truths, teaching people um, that they're beyond God's forgiveness, that they are unworthy, that they are inherently inferior, or that a mistake, that they're a mistake somehow unfit for God, or undermining, ridiculing their trust in Jesus. Unfortunately, that list is really long. There are many, many ways that we can tear down or destroy the faith of others. And on first glance, it seems like Jesus leaves this topic rather quickly and starts to talk about cutting off limbs and ripping out eyes. But I believe the second paragraph is related to the first. Oftentimes, our behavior towards others is simply an outgrowth of our own twistedness, our own brokenness, our habits, and deeply believed in lies. Our lack of perception, our lack of, 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 the, a lack of seeing these things, of, our, and our lack of perfection leads us to demand perfection in others often. Our failure to receive God's love like a child leads to withholding love from those who desperately need it. Jesus loves us deeply and deeply loves those who our actions affect deeply. So it should be no surprise that Jesus uses this severe hyperbolic language to show how important and vital it is to take strong measures to identify and remove brokenness in our lives. The church is full of imperfect people. You know that, I know that. Like we tend to say around union, everyone is welcome except perfect people. But there is a difference between being imperfect person who partners with the Holy Spirit to be healed from our own brokenness and an imperfect person who lets it run unchecked. People in healthy, Christ-centered communities don't harm other people's faith, even if it takes dealing radically with ourself, seeking help, asking tough questions. Like, why do I react that way? What triggers me? What benefit do I get from treating other people that way? Why did I say that to them? Why did I do that to them? We're designed to live in relationship with people 
And that means with people different than ourselves. That enriches, that creates understanding. It creates new possibilities that removes inequities. It gives deeper understanding of love. It affirms the truth of Jesus' words. It draws people to Christ by the love that they see. Community centered on Christ with these aspects happening in them is an amazing thing. But it's not easy. At least it's not always easy. To continually be flexible, to be humble, to deal with our sin requires love and hope. It requires a love that permeates to our core and disarms our ego, that washes out our fear and creates an open and loving stance towards others. It takes hope that expands our vision, reminds us we are part of a greater reality. Our future is guaranteed. And we do not have to live in the cage of me first, worrying that we're not going to get enough. That's why Jesus began with the cross and the resurrection. That's where the love and the hope is found that frees us to live this way. This is not pie in the sky language. You, union, provide a taste of this. Flexibility, we have an array of beliefs here. Not everyone agrees about everything, but we are centered on the crucified and risen Christ. Humility, in the world's eyes, we have some of the most overqualified burrito rollers, meal makers, food delivers, cleaners, tutors, neighbor lovers around. We have people using their gifts, serving in studios and on teams. You give yourself to learning hard truths about inequities and injustice and privilege and to listening to one another. Taking seriously the more vulnerable in faith, you're engaged in listening, in listening prayer, in groups like So You Want to Grow Spiritually, in Bible studies, and in book groups. You meet up with and welcome youth. You embrace a worship rhythm designed to know Christ more and grow in being agents of reconciliation, serving in the neighborhood. You live out faith in Jesus as adventure and relationship, not a straitjacket or an irrelevant practice or a merit-based religion. Now, this isn't to say, obviously, that we've arrived. None of us have. But evidence of the transformation set in motion by the cross and resurrection is leaking out. It's pouring out. Let's keep going. Especially in a time where something different from business as usual is dearly needed. Where can you grow in flexibility? Where can you grow in humility? in dealing with sin and brokenness. Let's start by dwelling on the crucified and risen Christ. Amen? Amen.